housekeeping things and, and do some introductions, but uh, really happy that you guys joined us this evening. And I know Dylan and myself are, are both really looking forward to this topic, um, something that we're very passionate about. So um, Ben kind of went over some logistical things um, in terms of like big picture, um, but, but really our hope, especially with a small group, is that this can really be a, a dialogue and a conversation. Um, we're really wanting this to be engaging and, and for you guys to think uh, about your own uh, health habits and, and your own lives, um, where, that can, where that can be improved, um, as well as just answering some questions. Um, we're, we're hoping to uh, spark some interest and, and maybe talk about some topics that uh, you know, you guys have heard about and, and we want to have some discussion, but um, we'll introduce ourselves here and then we'll kind of go through our, our topics in terms of exercise. We'll kind of kick things off there, um, go through some nutrition topics, and then um, let's talk about how, uh, you know, being physically healthy can really benefit us um, in terms of not just being, um, not just being uh, healthy, but um, better students, better people, better leaders. So um, Dylan, if you're there uh, and, and want to introduce yourself, I'll, I'll let you kick things off. I am here and uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you guys for joining us, taking time out of your summer and uh, what may or may not be a busy or hectic time for you. Uh, I'm Dylan Rhodes. I'm a brother from UNC Charlotte, the Epsilon Tall chapter down here in North Carolina, I'm currently holding it down as one of the only chapters in the state. Hopefully we can change that soon. Uh, I studied kinesiology uh, at UNC Charlotte. I got a degree in exercise science with a concentration in strength and conditioning. Uh, upon graduating, I went into the fitness industry, and I've had kind of an interesting role the past couple of years. So I have, uh, I have both served as a high-performance coach, working with professional athletes uh, across seven or eight you know, different professional levels of sports. And, and then most recently, I've actually taken over the marketing uh, for the company. So kind of a cool blend of, of business and industry. Uh, and hopefully will empower me to empower you guys with some cool knowledge tonight. Um, I was a 2018 undergraduate Hall of Fame inductee, you know, one of the greatest honors of my life to this day. Uh, and obviously, you know, much of the reason as to why I'm here now trying to just give it back. Uh, Dylan, do you want to share a little bit about um, why why this topic really matters to you and, and how this has influenced your life? Yeah, absolutely. So to, to give you guys a little bit of perspective, you know, as I'm sure you can relate, you know, school can get very busy, right? You're, you know, for a lot of people, it's the first time they've got, you know, a, a real sense of freedom to their life. It's the first time you may, you might not have someone telling you not to eat that thing or, you know, putting a plate in front of you with predetermined food, et cetera. Uh, and as I kind of got into the fraternity, into the lifestyle, you know, just the undergraduate lifestyle and the lifestyle that fraternity men can be subjected to as well, I actually ended up gaining somewhere in the neighborhood. I went into college weighing about 200 pounds, and then at the peak was up to about 247 pounds at the end of my junior year. Um, so I had taken on, you know, a few different leadership roles and was studying like crazy. And the story I told myself was, oh, you don't have time to work out or, you know, just grab something quick because you don't have time to cook. You don't have time to do this. You know, I, I, I basically told myself that it wasn't possible from the jump. And, you know, I found myself and that's why I included that bottom picture on the slide is uh, I'm actually at 247 pounds in that picture. Um, and thankfully through some of the knowledge that Dean and I are going to share with you today and a massive change in attitude, um, I've been able to drop, you know, close to 65 pounds, um, closer to 67 pounds, um, as I've kind of gotten out of school and I've kept it off now for about two years. Um, so, so this is a, a topic that's very near and dear to me and has helped me kickstart my professional career. Um, you know, and what I consider, a really good start into what adults like to call the real world. Uh, so I just hope I can pass along any kind of information and knowledge to you guys that will empower you to make good decisions and, you know, see positive changes in your life as well. Awesome. Thanks for that. Thanks for that intro, Dylan, and, and definitely have some good insight. That's for sure. 
Uh, we've had some fun creating this this presentation for you guys. Um, so my name is Dean. I'm a, a graduate from uh, our Purdue chapter. I was a, a founding father there and um, pretty heavily involved on campus and uh, you know, within the chapter actually ended up working for headquarters for a couple of years as well. Um, it took a couple of years off after getting my, my BS in biochemistry. Uh, I planned on going to medical school and uh, that didn't quite plan out as well as I'd hoped. And so I took a couple of years while working for the fraternity and uh, kind of reevaluated where I wanted to go professionally. And uh, I always kept coming back to I wanted to be in healthcare, but I didn't necessarily want to be a doctor or a nurse. And I really found my passion in influencing people's health uh, through food and, and through diet. And so I ended up, uh, I actually just graduated uh, at the end of April from the University of Michigan. I got my master's in public health uh, and nutritional sciences from the University of Michigan. Um, learned a lot of really great things and, and really challenged me to think about uh, food from a, a larger level. Um, I'm really interested in, in kind of using food as medicine and, and treating folks with uh, different disorders through their diet, but uh, learned quite a bit about like the public health realm of nutrition and, and thinking about um, population health. Um, while I was in grad school as well, I, I, I've always had a passion for fitness um, and exercise, and so I became a, a a personal trainer through the American College of Sports Medicine, and I've been working as a, a, a personal trainer basically for the past uh, year and a half now. Um, worked with a lot of really cool clients uh, at the University of Michigan and, and um, have recently relocated and, and looking for a new role there. Um, I, I've taken, I guess, more of an interest in, in runners and um, kind of that end of fitness, um, but I do have some. Uh, weightlifting background as well, um, probably not to the same level that Dylan does. Um, so I'll, I'll be continuing with a little bit more education as a, a dietetic intern on my way to become a registered dietitian. Um, and I've also got some background working for both a food bank uh, through my master's as well as um, a retail weight loss clinic like a Weight Watchers um, in between graduating from undergrad and, and going back to grad school. And um, as you can tell from my background and, and similar to Dylan's story, I've, I've always been passionate about health. And um, I have a, a bit of a different story and um, my message will uh, kind of echo uh, my story as well. So about six months before getting ready to uh, move off for college and, and start my career at Purdue, I um, was very unexpectedly and um, just completely caught off guard when I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And so from that moment on, as you can imagine, my world was kind of flipped upside down. And uh, suddenly I, I really had to be very conscious of everything that I was putting into my body and, and how, um, how much energy I was, I was spending. And, you know, it, it kind of changed my um, my exercise routine as well, as you can imagine. Um, I was a soccer player and I ran and, you know, did all sorts of stuff. And suddenly I kind of had to, had to, um, put all that on hold. So, um, I saw a bit of a, a different, uh, a different path, I guess you could say from, from Dylan. Um, I haven't grown a ton height wise. Um, but if you can imagine, um, I was pretty much considered like underweight, at the time I was diagnosed, uh, I would, I'm about 5'10 um, and weighed about 125, 130 pounds. Um, and so developing this good cognizant relationship with food and, and exercise uh, over the course of, of several years. And um, now I, I've maintained uh, a healthy weight, um, you know, I, even after graduating and, and being in the professional world for a few years now, I'm, I'm now five years out of college or out of undergrad, I guess I should say, um, and, and still maintaining that, that, I guess you could say college weight, which um, it, is a healthy range for me. So um, hopefully that gives a little bit of background on um, why this really matters to us and 
and why um, maybe why you can can trust our opinions and, and what we're going to talk about this evening. Um, so before we really jump into things uh, too much, um, want to just kind of kick things off with a brainstorm and and again, you guys can either uh, unmute yourselves and, and kind of chime in and, and give us your ideas or um, use the chat box. And I think Ben will, will help us uh, monitor that as we get going. Um, but really thinking about health and, and just at first glance, um, what, what are the first three words that come to mind when you hear the word health? or when you think about the topics of health. Um, so just take a minute, the, the kind of brainstorm some of those ideas or, or some of those words uh, that come to mind when, when you think of that word or that topic. I guess for me, the type of, it would be the type of lifestyle that you have. Okay, so so health being a lifestyle. I would say for me, it's um, not just a lifestyle. It's how you are able to grow yourself uh, productively and physically and mentally within both your personal life and your business professional life, being able to have a healthy balance between those two. Absolutely. So kind of taking some... Um, some topics in like mental health as well. Really cool. Dylan, what about you? What's a, what's a word that comes to mind uh, when you think about health? Mm. If I had to sum it, if I had to pull it all down to one word, I would say, and this might hit you a little bit differently. I would say intentional. Right. Uh, and I, I, the reason why is because, you know, from personal experience, you know, out to, you know, uh, professional experience every day, health is is it's something that's always present. But, you know, whenever whenever we're talking about positive health or good health, it's got to be intentional, you know, and whether we realize it or not, even bad health is intentional as well. It's just usually intentional because it was easy to make said, you know, set of choices. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that that's really the number one word that comes to my mind is intentional. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, and I, I think for me, the, the biggest thing is like health or not health um, is like habits or, or patterns. I think those are the big things because mm -hmm. um, a, a big thing for me is, you know, one one thing isn't going to necessarily make you healthy. It's it's repeated acts and it's it's several different acts that you know all kind of come together and 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 build health um so thank you guys for for sharing those ideas um one of the one of the things we kind of wanted to to do when we talk about this um is that health is a, a is a really broad term as we can kind of see and it means different things for different people um so we're gonna try to uh capture health as as best we can from um living as a college man and what that's like and and you know talk about some of the things we hear that maybe aren't uh aren't pieces of great advice um and hopefully um just have a really great conversation about what it means to build um build health while you're in college um and just one of the things that we wanted to kind of put a disclaimer on was just that there's a lot of conflicting evidence and there's a lot of different ideas that people have about what it means to be healthy. And part of that comes from it being such a broad term. But really, uh, when it all boils down to it, like you could find something that contradicts uh, something that we say and, uh, you know, take everything with a grain of salt and hopefully this helps you think critically as well. Um, this is all based on external experience uh, that Dylan and I have, have pulled some ideas um, and from research that, that we've uh, either done personally or that we've found from our various education backgrounds. So, so know that this isn't just, um, you know, what works for me personally and, and my own bias. We're really trying to, to avoid that uh, 
in this presentation. And so we want this to really be a healthy dialogue and, um, you know, challenge maybe some, some uh, traditional schools of thought. So um, does that sound okay to everybody so far? Yep. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so without further ado, I'll kind of let Dylan uh, talk a little bit about exercise and fitness. All right. So first and foremost, you know, you guys are going to see a little bit of a pattern as we roll through here tonight. You're going to see maybe we're going to tackle a little bit of myths or common thought processes or, you know, conceptions that are out there. Uh, and then we're going to kind of dial into what are the facts and, and what's the helpful knowledge and how's it actually going to help you. So as I kind of go through these, and especially since, you know, we've got a little bit more intimate of a crowd here, guys, feel free to chime in as you're reading through here. And I'll give a couple of seconds to answer as you're reading through some of these bullet points. Uh, is there anything on this list that jumps out at you and you're like, well, wait a minute, that's not a myth. You know, you're full of crap, dude. Uh, is there is there anything there that jumps out? Sweet. So basically, as we as we kind of go through here, if anything doesn't make sense, you know, guys, feel free to jump in. You know, we want this to be a dialogue. We want it to be more of a conversation and less of a um, less of an undergrad experience, you know, in the sense of you're sitting down and we're kind of running through slides. Uh, so I'll just kind of work my way through some of these. And, you know, I might dive in a little deeper on some might not uh, on others. And if you got any questions, guys, feel free to throw them in the chat or just jump in with them at any time. So obviously, you know, no pain, no gain. This is actually one that I think that's starting to kind of be broken down a little bit uh, as we, as you know, information and the flow of information and what professionals know in the industry gets better. You know, I think people are kind of starting to understand that, you know, usually pain is a warning signal, right? On a basic level, pain is your brain's opinion of something and it's, it's almost never a positive one, right? Um, so, you know, there's really no reason to work through pain. Uh, my workouts will undo beer and 2 a.m. fast food runs. This honestly, fellas, this just goes into one of those classic lies that I told myself when I was an undergrad. You know, there was actually a point, believe it or not, when I was at my heaviest where I was in the gym five days a week. Uh, none of it mattered at all because I was also, uh, you know, I can neither confirm nor deny that I may have been going out five times a week. Um, and you know, everything that comes into play with that as well, you know, let's not kid ourselves. Um, so, you know, the, the real piece to take away from that is you can't out train a bad diet boys. You just can't, um, you might be able to outrun it a little bit, but you're not going to be able to outwork it at the end of the day. Um, hit training is the only way to burn fat. You know, the entire fitness industry is obsessed with hit training everywhere you go. Everything's an interval. It's high intensity. It's almost like they don't even realize that there is an, uh, you know, an entire other world to exercise. Um, and there's actually, you know, there's a thousand different ways to burn fat or to hit a specific goal, no matter what that goal is. Uh, think of everything when it comes to exercise or a thought of exercise or a school of thought, et cetera. It's nothing but a tool in your toolkit, right? So if hit is a hammer and your goal is to hit a nail, then hit's a great tool. But if your goal is to mount something on a wall, right, you might need a little bit more than just a hammer. Uh, you might need just a little bit more of a nuanced approach. Uh, so moving down the line here, if I'm not sore, I didn't work hard enough. I mean, to sum it up without diving too deep down that rabbit hole, soreness is inflammation. Generally, the less inflammation in your body, the better. So soreness does not always equal progress. As a matter of fact, soreness can be a warning sign at some points. Uh, and if you're actually making strides forward, in your gains or your, your fitness, your health, you know, whatever term you want to use, you're actually going to see soreness less and less and less because your body's ability to adapt and handle the specific demands you're putting on it is actually going to increase. Uh, I can reduce fat in a specific area. Uh, you can, but you can't pinpoint the specific area, unfortunately. Right. So you hear a lot of people say, well, I just want to lose fat around my face, or I just want to lose fat around, you know, the lower stomach, et cetera, you know, the different people will lose different amounts of weight in different ways. You know, you may be someone that you drop 10 pounds and it appears that it all came from your face. You may be someone that you drop 10 pounds 
and you don't look any differently because your distribution was a little bit different. Tons of cardio is the only way to lose weight. You know, that's kind of on the other end of the spectrum from saying that HIIT training is the only way to burn fat. Uh, you can, you burn a, a, an extreme amount of calories uh, doing resistance training. Uh, matter of fact, on average, I believe, right? And if I'm wrong on this, I'm willing to be wrong, but I believe you actually burn somewhere in the neighborhood of three times as many calories uh, in a resistance training session than you would if you were to just hop on the treadmill or the elliptical for an hour. Um, so typically we'll see that one with women, but there are a lot of other men and, and people of all genders, uh, you know, kind of telling themselves like, okay, I've got to lose weight. I just need to go in and do cardio. I don't need to touch weights. It's not true. Uh, I have to crush myself in every workout. That ties into being sore, right? You, you don't have to crush yourself every workout. As a matter of fact, keeping your inflammation levels high, keeping your level of soreness high and, and overtraining your body, you know, is actually going to slow down uh, your process, no matter what your goal is. It doesn't matter if your goal is to lose weight, gain weight, lose muscle, lose fat, gain muscle, et cetera. You know, overtraining is never going to be a positive thing. At the end of the day, fellas, exercise is nothing but stress. Your body, when you take off sprinting, your body does not know the difference between sprinting because you want to get a workout in and there being a grizzly bear behind you. Your body can't tell the difference. Your, your brain might not, you know, your brain may know, right? But your body knows no difference. Your heart rate, you know, your heart, your organs, your stomach, your muscles, et cetera, they're all going to just do what they do. You know, they're simple machines in that regard. Uh, moving on blank gives me pain, but I can work through it. I mean, we've all seen the guy that's, you know, probably got a completely torn rotator cuff, but he's still doing overhead press in the gym and crushing himself. Um, I mean, that just goes into respecting your body. You know, if something is giving you pain, examine that, you know, it may be uncomfortable and it's, I think it's very similar to knowing that your car needs an oil change, but you just kind of keep driving anyways. Well, eventually it's going to show up. So, you know, you may as well catch it early as opposed to catching it, you know, when it has progressed into six or seven different problems. Um, that ties nicely into the next point, which is I have to lift heavy, heavy every session. Again, just 100% not true. You can lift well below your max um, or, you know, what would be considered a maximal effort uh, in all lifts for four weeks and you're going to get stronger. I mean, it's not, it's not as simple as X plus Y, you know, equals Z. And then I have to exercise every day to make gains. Uh, your body needs rest, right? So when a lot of people, a lot of people actually make gains and I, and you know, we can define that however you want, depending on what your goal is. If I'm a sprinter, then gains for me is going to be being able to get my 100 meter dash time down. If I'm a bodybuilder, then gains for me are quite literally going to be a, a gain of weight of 8 to 10 or 12, however many pounds I need, right, to have the mass that I'm looking for. But you make those gains when you recover, and recovery comes with rest, as in when your body is not in a state of alert or a state of fight or flight. Um, and to simplify that even further, when your body's not in a state of working out, right, you need rest, you need sleep. Right. That is quite literally the foundation for your body to operate, you know, in concordance with movement and nutrition and stress management, et cetera. So now that we've kind of tackled some of the myths and some of the minutia and things that are, you know, maybe not so productive out there. I'm going to give you guys four baby steps to great health. And I call these baby steps for a reason. Right. A lot of times, and we'll get into this conversation a little bit later in the presentation, but a lot of times people think when they set a goal, their goal needs to be at the mountaintop. Well, you know, that's great. But if you set your goal super high, if your goal is automatically on the ceiling and you're not equipped to jump to the ceiling, you're just going to be jumping and swatting at air all day. Right. So instead, what you should do is find find what lets you get just a step further. What is the minimum I can do or what is the minimum if done every day that will help me get to where I want to be as quick as possible with the least amount of risk. I have found these four things to be just that for health in general, right? So number one being find a way to sweat every day. 
You know, it doesn't matter if you are cleaning the house or washing your car or mowing the grass or going on a hike or, you know, um, walking around the city or maybe you've got a job. Maybe you're a server or a bartender or something. You know, odds are you're going to be moving. Right. So you just really need to find a way to move and ideally find a way to break a sweat, find a way to get that heart rate a little bit elevated and let your body know, like, hey, we're doing this thing um, every single day no matter what that is. And a pro tip and bonus points for you, if you can find a way to do that, that you also find really fun and helps you kind of recharge the batteries mentally and emotionally. If you can tap into that and you'll be well on your way just with baby step number one. Uh, Baby step number two, I'm purposely not going to go into this one too deep because uh, obviously, you know, that's Dean's forte and he's got a lot of good content coming your way on it, but you need to eat decently. Now notice that says decently not perfectly. You just need to eat decently. At the end of the day, your meals need to be more positive than negative. Um, And we can talk about what exactly that means a little bit later. Bullet point number three, two to five structured workouts per week. Um, I'll share another little story here. I hate to keep talking about myself, but I'll just use the most relevant example. You know, I used to be a guy that I would work out five, six days a week, all through high school, all through my athletic careers everything, you know, it was, it was hard. I was hard pressed to take a day off. Um, and while that works for some people, I actually started to make massive leaps and bounds when I pulled that back to three times a week. And so now working with athletes, I mean, I'll I'll give you guys a perfect example. Um, I've got a professional athlete right now. He is a, uh, a very popular running back and he's a complete workhorse. He's only 24 years old. And uh, he runs the ball down here in Carolina, but he is one of those guys that, that we've got to, we've got to get it in his head that he doesn't need to crush it seven days a week. He doesn't. And then he finally kind of gave into that uh, and we pulled it back to three days a week. And then on the off days, he just had really specific work. He put on 17 pounds of muscle right between seasons and was able to come back a lot more durable. He didn't lose a lick of speed, a lick of uh, uh, athleticism. You know, he was able to kind of keep it all moving because he gave his body that rest. So, you know, aim for two to five structured workouts per week. Once a week's not going to get you anything. Twice a week will probably be a minimum effective dose. And then, you know, if you're someone that you have a hard time getting a habit in place and you know that you have to do something repetitively, right, to be successful at it, bump that up to five. But give yourself a couple of days to rest and kind of intentionally chill out physically. Uh, And then the last one, and this is the one I'm probably the biggest stickler on, probably also because I fail at this one the most, unfortunately, Uh, a minimum of seven hours of sleep per night. There's a great book uh, by a guy named Matthew Walker. He's he's got a PhD in um, he's got a PhD in in neuroscience and he, you know, concentrated in sleep. He's been on Joe Rogan. Uh, You know, maybe we'll throw the link to maybe I'll throw the link to that in the chat uh, here in a minute. But essentially, he wrote a book called Why We Sleep. And fellas, it's one of those within the first 10 to 15 pages, you're going to be like, man, I don't sleep enough. And it low key might be ruining my life. Um, So basically, a minimum of seven hours of sleep per night, like that is literally the minimum. Now, you know, I look back to college days, and I probably averaged four, if that. Um, and so it's no secret why I found myself in this just state of total disrepair. Um, you know, to, to not spend too much more time on sleep, just think of it like this. This was one thing that really shocked me and kind of was just a little punch to the gut. Anything less than seven hours of sleep is low level brain damage. And the way that Matthew Walker described it essentially was anything less than seven hours of sleep. And you may as well have a professional boxer like jab you in the head. It's like the same level of brain damage. Um, if you're not giving your brain that opportunity to shut off for a minute, go to a different place and recharge. So if you just do these four things, literally just these four things, you'll see massive, massive leaps and bounds in your health, physically, mentally, emotionally, etc. cetera. 
and kind of tying all of this in. So we, now we've talked about, hey, here's what you should do. Now here are some guiding principles. Um, obviously, as SIGTALs, we love that word principles. So I'm going to define it just a little bit deeper as we go here. In this sense right here, principles are nothing but statements of fact, regardless of opinion, that help you optimize your behavior. So I want you guys to kind of think about that as I list out these principles. Ironically, uh, there's five. I fell one short. Um, so as I go through these five principles, you know, just kind of think, okay, this is to help me optimize my behavior so that excellence is normalized. Excellence is the minimum standard. Um, and again, I've already said it a couple of times. Don't work through pain. There's no reason if your ankle, shoulder, back, knee, et cetera, is jacked up. There's no reason for you to crush it. Like if your knee is jacked and you don't know what's going on, it's bothering you. There's no need to load up 315 on a barbell and squat it 12 times for seven sets. There's just no need to do that. Trust me. I've had three ACL surgeries. Not worth it. Um, moving down the list, take the ego out of your workouts. Uh, this one, this one is so crucial. You know, it's, it's really just hitting the pause button and or really just hitting like the slow motion button and just saying, okay, I'm going to pull that extra 10 off or pull that extra 25 off. I'm going to get the form right because I saw a video of myself or I saw myself in the mirror. Honestly, my form's trash. I understand that if my form isn't in the right place, I'm slowing myself down and the hours I'm spending in here aren't going to be as productive and I'm wasting my time and my time's precious, right? So if all of those factors in that equation, just kind of take the ego out of it, get the form right, understand that, you know, it's much more of a long game. You know, it's not, it's not always just this three weeks before your beach trip or this three weeks before your, uh, you know, your buddy's bachelor party, which you guys will probably start getting into in a couple of years, et cetera. You know, it's more, it's much more of a long game. So I would just challenge you there guys to play the long game, take the ego out of it and play the long game. Uh, if we're talking a little bit more technical in your workouts, here's like the general flow chart of what you should try to do when it comes to joints and getting your body moving. When it comes to any joint in your body, right, ideally, you should try to stabilize it, then mobilize it, and then try to go for gains, right? So we'll use the, we'll use the hip, or actually, use, let's use the shoulder. So the shoulder is a phenomenal example, right? The vast majority of people, believe it or not, can't even raise their shoulder over their head without their spine, right, having to compensate to help them get it there. Uh, so that means that the shoulder inherently is an unstable joint. It's kind of like a golf ball that sits on a tee, right? It is the most mobile joint in the body naturally, but it's also the, le the least stable because of that. So you need to stabilize that, right? For most guys, especially, right, where we grow up, we're told, you know, hip push-ups, bench press, upper body, make sure you get curls for the girls, et cetera. The majority of men um, you know, just speaking frankly, don't have any issues with shoulder stability unless there's some kind of history. Um, you know, I mean, some people are legitimately just hypermobile, but that's kind of rare. Unless there's some kind of history, you know, maybe you were a wrestler and, you know, you got in a bad position on the mat and your shoulder got, you know, your labrum got torn. Maybe you were a football player, you took a hit and it went awkwardly. You know, maybe you were a soccer player, someone slide tackled you, you fell on an outstretched hand and dislocated your shoulder, et cetera. You always want to work to stabilize that joint and then work to mobilize that joint, aka does it move the way it's designed to move. And only after you check those first two boxes, fellas, should you try to really push it, right, and get gains or try to put muscle mass on it or try to get it cut or toned or defined um, or stronger, especially stronger, right? If that joint doesn't have a prerequisite amount of stability, and a prerequisite amount of, ha of moving the way it was designed to move, then you're essentially just reinforcing dysfunction. And you do that long enough, you're going to end up with some kind of debilitating injury, right? It ties right nicely into playing the long game. Um, diving into that a little bit deeper, you know, generally you should work through patterns. So if you're working, if you're, you know, trying to structure a workout, I'll give you a perfect example. So with our athletes, Right. I'll use, you know, something. So, for example, I had a group of MLB players a few years, uh, a few months ago. So basically, we just tried to work them through very specific patterns each workout. Right. We needed to make sure that 
We did something that allowed them to extend through the knee. So think like a squat, a lunge, something that is changing. If you think about your thigh bone and your shin bone, something that is changing the joint angle through that knee, right? We try to do something that is hip dominant, like a deadlift or a Romanian deadlift or any kind of what we call hinging work. We tried to make sure that we got a horizontal push, like a bench press or a push up. We tried to make sure that we got a horizontal pull, like a a, a row, um, any kind of row, actually. Uh, you know, and then if they can advance beyond that, we'd also try to get a vertical pull, et cetera. Uh, and we always want to make sure that we got core. And because we were working with MLB players, we needed to make sure that shoulders were on point. We also needed to make sure that they're able to rotate through their upper body. So. I say all of that to say, think through what is relevant and what's important for you and make sure that you're really trying to work through those patterns. There's all kinds of good resources on there, uh, around the, around the internet on that. And it'll be a game changer for you because the better your body moves, the quicker you're going to be able to hit your goals. Like, I don't care what your goals are. It doesn't matter if you're trying to be Mr. Olympia, if your shoulders, your hips, your knees, et cetera, can move and do what they're supposed to do right? You're going to hit that goal much more quickly. All right. And then I'll bring all of that home to kind of say, you know, the wider the base, the taller the pyramid. So essentially, no matter what your goal is, right? If your goal is the top of that pyramid, the higher you want that to be, the wider the base has to be to support it. So everything that we've kind of talked to this like little 10 minute crash course I've given you guys, you know, it, you have to have basically the right amount of foundation in order to achieve said goal, no matter what it is. And the higher that goal is, the wider the base has to be to support it. That is one of the most beautiful uh, analogies and kind of like things to help you visualize fitness specifically, um, no matter what you're trying to accomplish. Awesome. Uh, any questions for... Dylan or for either of us so far, guys. I do not have any. Appreciate the response. No, I do not have any questions as well. Thank you for the expertise and the recommendations for both of us. So appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so we'll kind of shift gears here a little bit and, um, you know, switch a little bit more on the 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 input rather than the output uh, in terms of in terms of health and talk a little bit about nutrition so kind of similar to um we're basically going to follow this same format that that dylan kind of went on um you know going through some myths and some things that that guys hear uh you know particularly things that i've heard um especially when you tell people like yeah i'm going to be a dietitian I work with food a lot. Um, I know a lot about diet. Uh, there's a there's a lot of myths out there, and um, this again is going to be something that's like very personal and and very individualized. So I want you guys to take a, a minute and um, look things over and and see if there are any uh, big myths that that jump out for you there, or um, if there's any questions that you guys have or something that you've heard that you're like, oh no, I kn I know that's true. I guess one of them for me is like intermittent fasting is better for weight loss. Okay. So you've heard something along or like heard that that's the, the best option. Well, for me, I've done my research and I, I know that like it's good for short term, but it can also do a lot of long term as well. Okay. Yeah. So you've done intermittent fasting or uh, I have through like my sophomore and junior year of college okay. and it works really well. Some, there are some downfalls of it of like, once you start out, it takes time to adapt. Otherwise you are draining most of the time because you're not used to like the lack of calories in a specific time frame. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. And, and that's kind of a, a common theme through, through a couple of these myths, and we'll kind of walk through them. Um, just like your body being in that conservation mode, 
like you're in starvation and you know as you can imagine when your body's in starvation it isn't like oh yeah let's like just get rid of all this stuff it's actually like trying to hold on to everything that it can so yeah that's a that's a really good point i would say for me um one of the nutrition myths listed um it's too expensive to eat healthy um i found ways where i can make a meal and um, it may only cost me maybe fifteen dollars to put it all together where it's maybe like maybe something with like um like a chicken parmesan or like a salad that i create for a lunch maybe i'm having or even like simple snacks on on the way um that help me out throughout the day to keep my nutrition up at a in a healthy and a productive way i would say awesome yeah i, I think that's a really common myth that you know oh i don't know like like Dylan said at the beginning of the talk, you know, oh, I don't have the time or I don't have the money to eat healthy. You know, I don't have the time to cook for myself. And there's there's some interesting ways that you can obviously get around that. Um, and, and a personal passion of mine is, um, you know, food insecurity. And we can I won't dive down that rabbit hole too much, but that's a that's a big topic. You know, like being able to eat healthy is, um, you know, it's it's so expensive. Um, well, let's just kind of pop through some of these other myths, uh, you know, just so we kind of cover our bases. Um, I think the classic one for, for guys is like, if I want to get bigger muscles or I want to get stronger, like I've got to eat a ton of protein and, um, it's remarkable the, the amount of protein that your body actually needs in a given day. Um, so what's generally recommended for, for adult men is actually somewhere between 45 and 55 grams per day. Now, granted, that's your average run of the mill guy. If you ever get into bodybuilding or, you know, you want to become Mr. Olympia, that may change. Or if you're like a super marathon runner or something like that, um, those needs may change, but you actually really don't need as much protein as you, as you think you do. Um, I think that's a really common myth and a lot of people ask me about that a lot. Um, so that given in mind, you know, 45 to 55 grams a day, um, you know, you can probably just say an even 50 to, to make it an easy number to remember. And if you just have six ounces of chicken breast in a day, that's 32 grams right there. So that's like 60, more than 60% of your protein in the day. If you just have like a chicken breast. So you don't have to like load up like chicken and steak and, you know, double beans and all that kind of stuff at, at Chipotle and, you know, to try to get enough protein. Um, the flip side of that coin, I think, is a lot of people think that uh, you can't get protein from a vegetarian diet. So whether that's, um, you know, cheese or tofu or, uh, you know, a, a ton of other other sources and um, I think the other common myth is that uh, plant-based proteins are, are not complete or they're missing amino acids. Um, they actually have all of their amino acids because plants also have to build proteins to function much like our cells do, but they aren't in exactly the right amount or the right combination as human or animal cells need. So you can actually get a uh, complete, all of your plant proteins are going to be complete, um, but you might just need to have some variety there um, in terms of changing up where your sources are coming from. Uh, doing a juice cleanse or any other sort of like quick fix, magic bullet, if you will, to getting healthy, um, nine 99.9% .9 of these times, if you see an immediate five pound weight loss, uh, you know, in the first couple of days, there's a really good chance that's all water weight. Um, and that's not going to be sustainable. And, you know, we really want to think about, uh, kind of like Dylan said, the long game. So making sure that you're setting realistic expectations for, for what your body's going to do and, and building a healthy relationship with food. Um, you know, doing a crash course, or I'm going to do, um, you know, this diet for two weeks or whatever, uh, you know, to get ready for spring break or the bachelor party. Uh, 
you know, those aren't necessarily going to develop those habits, like I mentioned in the beginning. Um, intermittent fasting, to kind of go back to this, uh, it's that same kind of idea, again, that if your body's in this conservation mode, it's going to try to hang on to as much as it can. So if you're not still giving it the nutrients that it needs, your body won't actually shed those, those, um, that fat uh, that you're trying to get rid of. And from the research that I've seen, um, doing like a 50%, 100%, like going back and forth, uh, like day in, or only consuming all of your uh, calories during a certain time of each day, um, keeps your body in that conservation mode and then actually makes you, um, or makes you more likely to overindulge when you are able to eat those calories. Um, so actually there was a really cool study that I saw that um, took like a, an intermittent fasting schedule where you ate hundred percent of your normal calories and then 50% of your normal calories and kind of alternated days um, in one group and another group that just ate 20% less uh, than their baseline every day. And that group actually saw better weight loss than, than the group that uh, switched up their caloric intake. Um, again, that blanket statement that a certain food or uh, a certain nutrient or um, you know sugar uh, being bad or unhealthy for you. Uh, the classic example that I always use is eggs. There's a new study, it seems like every six months, about whether eggs are good or bad, or you should eat them or you shouldn't. Um, and I think that we really can't say, just like there's no magic bullet that's good or bad for health. There isn't one food that's going to make you unhealthy. Um, you know, so using the eggs example, and, and again, if you're eating a balanced diet, one particular food isn't, isn't going to make you make you unhealthy or is going to be bad for you. Um, organic being the healthiest way to eat. Uh, I lived in Colorado for a year uh, between undergrad and grad school, and this was a big thing out there. People would only eat organic or you know, thought that they were eating healthier because it was organic. Um, if you actually look at the, the nutritional information or the nutrition labels from a, a regular food and an organic food, the, the nutrition is exactly the same. Um, it's really just the way that it's prepared or the way that it's farmed um, or the way that it's made. There, there really is no difference nutritionally. Um, plus, it's a, a very loosely uh, regulated term. So a lot of places can say they're organic and they might not actually be. Um, eating vegetarian is a healthier choice. Um, just plain and simple. There's, there's a way to be a, a really bad vegetarian. Um, I've, I've got a cousin who's, who's like that. He was really overweight and unhealthy. And his doctor said, you know, it'd be really good for you if you went vegetarian. So he basically took that as like, I can eat all the pasta I want, as long as there's no meat sauce, I can eat cheese pizza, you know, things like that. Like there's, there's ways around that. So just because um, you choose to go vegetarian doesn't necessarily mean that you're healthy. Um, and we'll kind of talk about some ways that you can, can get around that. Um, I feel like we already kind of talked about uh, it being too expensive to, expensive to eat healthy. Um, I think that's a thing that more and more college campuses are realizing that uh, giving their students resources on uh, making sure that they do have access to healthy foods uh, is, is really important. And I think that's a growing field. Um, eating healthy during the week. So you can do whatever you want on the weekends. Um, this kind of, I guess, goes back to that, that intermittent fasting, uh, kind of idea. And that, um, you know, we're, we're really thinking about the long term and building a, a good, strong health habit. And if your diet is, really, really strict or, or really, um, really exclusive to the point where you have like a cheat day or I'm going to eat really well during the week. And then, you know, Saturday doesn't count sort of thing. 
um, that's probably not a great step for you to jump into right away. That that's a pretty un not I don't want to say unrealistic goal, but that's a really lofty goal. If you know that you can't you can't stick with it for seven days, so you've got to have a cheat day where you're allowed to have that particular food or something like that. Um, it also kind of encourages overindulgence. So you know. I'm not going to have pizza during the week, but I can have it, you know, on the weekend. You're probably going to have more pizza that day than you would have throughout the rest of the week if you told yourself, like, it's no big deal if I have a little bit of pizza. Um, and again, kind of reiterating that idea of um, developing that healthy relationship with food. Again, elimination diets uh, are, are really hard and um, really take a big toll on your your mental health as well if you're saying like oh no i can't have that or you know if you just say like i can have a little bit of that or not you know i don't need to have the entire pizza i'm just going to have a slice um and then the last one here just uh you know if you want to be healthy you've got to take a multivitamin or some kind of supplement um if you're getting that food or those nutrients from your diet, uh, there really is no reason to, to take a multivitamin. And um, I, I guess when I say supplement, the big one that I get asked about is protein. Um, again, there's a really good chance that you're getting enough protein in your diet already that you probably don't need to add an additional you know, 25 grams um, in just one scoop of protein. Um, what you end, And especially with protein particularly, uh, your body doesn't have a storage mechanism for that. So if your body doesn't have a way to use it or need it right then, then it's going to get rid of it. And so uh, the thing that um, some folks and some friends of mine joke about is, you know, a lot of supplements and a lot of multivitamins and things like that, uh, what you're ultimately paying for is, you know, some really expensive urine. Uh, cause you just end up excreting it, which yeah, Dylan kind of gives me the, like turns his nose up, like that's kind of gross. Um, but really if you're eating a balanced diet, unless you're told by your doctor that you have a deficiency in something or that, um, you know, your iron is low or your B12 is low or something like that, uh, you probably don't need a, a dietary supplement. So, um, Want to want to be cognizant of time here, boys. Uh, just some tips that that I think are easy to follow, and um, some some simple things to remember moving forward. Really, just being aware of what goes into your body. I think that's the biggest thing that I try to preach to everybody. Um, just having a balanced diet, and you get some variety. I think a lot of folks think that if I'm going to eat healthy, it has to be grilled chicken, brown rice and broccoli florets five days a week. And nobody's gonna stick on a diet like that because it sucks. Um, you know, having some variety, having some fun recipes, um, you know, especially with all the resources that are out there, it's a really easy way to find, um, you know, fun recipes and, uh, you know, good food that you can try. Um, especially if you can just like throw together things that are in your pantry, like I've had this, can of black beans forever what can i what can i make with that yeah uh, it's, it's funny you it's it's funny you mentioned that because like when i was deployed that's basically all i was eating for i was eating like egg white omelets for breakfast and chicken breast broccoli and brown rice for lunch and dinner mm -hmm. every day a week and where i was having like one cheap meal of subway that's all i was eating but like that's what i liked it now that's not yeah. for everyone Right. Yeah, that was just, that was just me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's another thing with, with diet, you know, is, is it's so very personal from a, from a, this is what works for me, but also from like a, a taste profile. If you consider like cultural competency, you know, what foods are important to different cultures, um, you know, things like that. Uh, yeah. It's, it, it's what you have a taste for and, um, I know some people who eat really great and they're also very picky. And so they don't, they don't venture out and try new recipes a lot. So, um, and then these two tips kind of go back 
uh, kind of go hand in hand, just a way to, um, get some color and some variety in your diet and, um, you know, have some fun. Um, a, a pretty, pretty easy recommendation is, um, five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, obviously fruits have some, uh, a ton of nutrients and um, vitamins and things in them. Um, and so you're getting those additional health benefits. Um, not to say it, it, it all comes down to substitutions, really. Um, I'm not going to be someone who tells you like, well, you know, don't have the cake and have a banana instead. It's just not realistic. But if you can find ways to, to incorporate more fruits and vegetables into your diet, um, and then try to eat the rainbow if you can, um, this will also encourage you to, to try some new foods, um, promote some variety in your diet. So again, it isn't just, um, you know, the same thing every day, um, unless that's what you, what you care for and what you like, or, you know, what your circumstances are. Um, and last couple ones, again, thinking about the long game, um, making small changes. Um, these are really what's going to be the most sustainable for you in, in the long run. So thinking about what substitution can I make? Like, you know, if I, if I want to eat a little bit healthier, maybe I'm going to grab, um, you know, the celery and hummus instead of the bag of chips um, as a side with lunch or, um, you know, I'm going to go for the low sodium pasta sauce instead of the regular, you know, little, little substitutions like that can really make a big difference. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, make a note here, just look at being cognizant of the sodium, the saturated fat and the added sugar and things. Um, I think from a research perspective, um, those are the big three that I think people are really looking at right now and, and thinking about the adverse health outcomes that are tied to them. So um, taking a look at uh, where that is on your nutrition label and um, you know, really just uh, being aware of uh, everything that, that you're putting into your body. So um, any questions from a, from a nutrition standpoint? I just want to make uh, one comment about the nutrition chip slide that you're talking about. Yeah. So when I was a uh, undergraduate, um, I'm a alumnus brother of the Kappa chapter at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So I graduated just back in 2018. So um, during the first part of my undergraduate career, um, I had kind of more of a, I would say probably a B or C level um, eating and healthy lifestyle. But then once I got more into learning it from not just my fraternity brothers, but also um, like I even took a uh, stress management class in my um, last couple of years at college. So uh, things like that, where I was able to learn healthy eating habits, um, sleeping habits, like um, I was able to incorporate more things like fruits and vegetables into more of my diets and my e regular eating habits. Um, so that's helped me um, even to this day, being an alumnus member of uh, Sigma Tau Gamma, where now working in the real world, where um, I want to make sure that my body and my mind, between healthy eating habits, exercising, and getting enough sleep every day, um, are able to help me be productive in both my personal life as well as when I'm at work as well. Then, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Did you start to like feel some changes when you when you started to make those? when you started to make those changes in your diet? Yeah, as an undergraduate you're talking about? Right. Yes, um, yeah, so things were, um, I know like one of the first times that actually I had broccoli, that I ate broccoli was uh, when I tried it with chicken alfredo actually. Uh, they gave me the options of certain vegetables that you could put in it and I thought just today that um, I was gonna try broccoli the first time and it actually turned out really good. So I incorporated that. Um, I started to eat a lot more like um, salads and things like that, um, trying to incorporate more vegetables and fruits into my diet where I'd have like smoothies or things like that and right. trying to eliminate some of those earlier unhealthy foods and drinks that maybe I would have in maybe let's say my freshman and sophomore years. 
um, that wouldn't be so healthy to my body internally that I was able to um, break from those unhealthy habits and be able to um, grow um, in a healthier lifestyle going forward in my the rest of my college career and now again um, and as alumnus of Sigma Tau Gamma. Nice. Nice. Dylan, you want to wrap things out? Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, listen, but you know, before I go any further, I, you know, I want to apologize for assuming that Dean and I were just talking to undergrads. So, you know, yeah. my my bad to not read the room. Um, so here's what I want to do. We're going to shift gears just um, talking about fitness and um, nutrition, and we're going to tie it more into like real world, you know, relevant examples, and kind of just wrap about what you'll get out of investing in this, um, you know, in eating healthy, living healthy, moving healthy, et cetera. So, you know, did kind of a deep dive on the correlation between you know, positive health and leadership. And, you know, think of this as being physically fit, having good habits, you know, your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, are all in good spots. Um, one of the biggest benefits that you will see if you're actually in a place of good health is the law of mimicry. So essentially, you know, all, all that is, is if you're in a leadership position, right, the chances that the people that work, you know, the people that rely on you or work on your team, et cetera, they're going to subconsciously or consciously shift their behaviors and their attitudes to, to you, right? So you're in a position of influence, a position of authority. You can kind of begin to influence people um, indirectly, right, to maybe shift their habits. And usually if you're, if you're a disciplined individual and, you know, you're kind of buttoned up and you've got your you've got your your t's crossed and your eyes dotted the likelihood that everyone else in the room or on your team staff etc uh, is are, you know is going to follow suits a lot higher and then moving into some of the other benefits of health and how that helps you specifically as being a leader you've got increased cognitive function which is literally your ability to take information in separate it into categories and, you know, kind of analyze it. So essentially you're as a leader, right? At the end of the day, what makes a leader a leader is making good decisions. You know, like what is a common denominator? Yes, it's being a good person. Yes, it's being, you know, transfor uh, transformational, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if you're in a leadership position, the odds are you were put there so you could make the best decisions for that specific role, right? So having your health in a good spot, also means that your decisions will more than likely be in a good spot, unless you're just incompetent, in which case we can't help you. Sorry. But overall, right, your your cognitive function is going to increase, which means your decision making process will be better and smoother and more efficient. Your creativity level will increase as well. Uh, and sleep is tied into that one largely. Nutrition is tied into that one largely as well um, because of you know gut and hormones and everything that kind of works into that and essentially you know the more easily you're able to access your brain's reserves right the easier in theory you'll be able to solve problems that you're going to face so increase creativity increase problem solving decrease problems uh, moving into that, you know, obviously, if you're if you're fueling your body in the right ways, and you are also, you know, conditioning your body to be able to handle certain demands, your energy level is going to increase, right? Especially if you're sleeping as well. Um, the more energy you're able to bring to your days, the harder you're able to attack your days, right? The higher your floor, the higher your ceiling as well, right? So there's a big correlation between energy level and productivity you know if you're not tapering off at two in the afternoon as hard as you once were and you're able to kind of keep the train rolling on your tax if you're waking up feeling good and ready to roll and you don't have to you know have that morning where you're dragging and you got to get three cups of coffee in you before you're even really present you know and then at the end of the day when you come home you've got a little bit of energy left over to actually tackle your personal life um and any other projects you might have going on and then it on top of 
all of that increased confidence as well. This 100% has to do with the fact that you're looking good and you're feeling good, right? And people are going to be able to see that. People are going to be able to feel that. They're going to be able to experience that um, because you're going to like the way you look. You're going to like the way you feel. Ultimately, you're going to love the way you live as well. Um, so you're automatically going to kind of inject more positive energy in certain situations. Just to dive just a touch deeper. And again, like, you know, I am taking a look at the clock here. It establishes discipline, right? So I don't know if you guys are familiar with a guy named Jocko Willink, but he is currently on like a 300 or 400 day streak of every single morning at 345 in the morning. He puts up a post on Instagram. And it's like a picture of his watch and his gyms in the background. Um, so for him, you know, fitness and I mean, ultimately positive habits are nothing but a vehicle to stay disciplined, a vehicle to kind of anchor his day around something and go ahead and start his day with a W. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a huge momentum and compound effect that, that ties into that. And again, the more disciplined you are, the more disciplined the people around you are likely to be. Um, you know, we are very much mammals and simple animals when it comes to that kind of stuff. It regulates, it regulates hormone levels, which leads to more balanced mental health, you know, decreases symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, there are a lot of good studies around inflammation levels dropping and depression and, depression and anxiety instances dropping as well. Um, at the end of the day, if you're moving your body consciously, right? Your inflammation levels are generally going to be a little bit lower just because your body is, is lubricated for lack of a better term. And then, you know, also if you're fueling your body with the right stuff, you're not going to be promoting inflammation. You know, you're going to be giving your body what it needs and it's going to be a well-oiled machine. And, uh, that really allows your brain and all the things that make you, you emotionally and mentally that allows them to do their, you know, to do their part as well. Uh, Moving on a little bit, this was something I thought was super interesting. Physically fit people tend to earn about 9% more annually on average as opposed to those who are not physically fit. Um, now, as we were kind of rolling through this and, you know, we're kind of walking through our slides earlier, I forget who said it. I don't know if it was it was Ben or Dean, but, you know, one of them kind of chimed in when we got to this slide and was like, well, yeah, I mean you know, more confident or more productive people are going to get promotions more frequently. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. So it's kind of cool to see that there's actually hard data that if you take care of yourself physically, right, these other dominoes are going to fall and you actually end up earning more money um, or the likelihood that you earn more money, right, is 9% is higher, which depending on how much you make, that 9% could be a lot. Uh, establishes a goal setting and an achievement dynamic. You know, we've talked around discipline a lot, but essentially, if you're a leader or you're a person who's trying to live a life of impact, which I firmly believe that SIGTALs are, then, you know, you are going to be someone who's consistently setting goals and you're going to be someone who really values achievement because excellence and um, excellence, leadership, et cetera, are important things to you. So setting health goals and accomplishing them, right? Really kind of just drives that dynamic home in your brain. And it lets you apply that to all different kinds of areas of life. Uh, and then in, at the end of the day as well, you're more likely to communicate positive body language, right? And 100% look good, feel good, play good. You guys have probably heard that analogy before, but it's a real thing, right? If you if you put on the suit or you put on the whatever your work attire is, and you genuinely know that like you're rocking that, then you're going to automatically have a more positive attitude around your day, which means that your interactions with people are automatically going to be more positive and you will uh, attract better things into your life. And you'll actually end up distancing yourself right from negative things in your life. So it's, it's really a huge domino effect. Yeah, funny story. I actually used that that same kind of principle that Dylan was just mentioning um, in uh, testing in college. Look good, feel good, test good. <laughs> it's uh, real. Yeah. Uh, so you guys have any questions so far before we kind of jump into our last activity? I do not. Okay. I do not as well. Cool. 
Um, so, so last thing that we guys, uh, that we wanted to do here with our, our last couple minutes, uh, you know, again, being conscious of time, um, really want to set aside some time for you guys to maybe think about some of the topics that we've covered tonight um, and, and think about a 2020 health goal. So whether that be um, something that you want to accomplish in the next month by the end of 2020, or, you know, potentially by the end of next school year or the end of, or maybe, you know, next, next, and uh, next anniversary of, of SIGTA. Um, you know, I want to give you a couple minutes here to, to think about some goal setting. So um, hopefully you guys are familiar with, with smart goal setting. So being kind of specific, uh, something measurable, something that's attainable, realistic, and timely. Um, you know, and just jot down a couple things, uh, you know, don't want it to be super broad. Like I want to eat better or I want to eat healthier. Or, I want to be healthy. Um, you know, what, what's something specific that we've kind of talked about and, um, you know, also think about, um, those additional benefits like Dylan talked about that you'd also like to gain from that healthier lifestyle. So whether that be, the the sense of accomplishment that you did something big or um, that you want to feel more confident or have better mental health. Um, also jot down some some additional benefits that you'd like to get out of your your healthier lifestyle here. 